that. So let's get started. We're going to start with chapter 11. So um, I'm going to uh, send you the PowerPoint. So if you want to walk through, I'm going to go through the slides and walk through the lecture notes. So let's get started. So chapter 11 is focusing on oral presentation. So I know a lot of people in class said that they were worried and scared about presenting um, public speaking and presenting in front of people. So this will help you kind of calm down and organize your thoughts and structure your thoughts. Um, so let's get going. So chapter 11, oral presentation. We're going to talk about delivery techniques. And let's start with the role of business presentations. So role of business presentations. If you think about it, a weak presentation is going to waste time and money and reflect poorly on the speaker. So if you're working for an organization or a corporation and you give a bad presentation, not only does it reflect poorly on yourself, but it's going to reflect poorly on the company or the organization um, that you work for. So like I said, everything you do represents who you are. So when you're speaking publicly, that also represents who you are. So role of business presentations. Weak uh, presentations waste time and money and also reflect poorly on the speaker. So think about these things when you are planning. Uh, making a presentation involves good planning, logical organization, effective collaboration, uh, proficient technology, useful meaning visual support, and strong delivery skills. So I'll walk through those again for you. Uh, making presentations involves the following. Good planning, logical organization, effective collaboration, proficient technology use, meaningful user visual support, and strong delivery skills. So planning the presentation, you act, you don't want to wing it. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'll just wing it, it'll be fine. We're going to know if you did that. So you need to actually plan it. Um, right now, I want you to open up the Stephen Duckett video uh, that focuses on Alberta Health Services. So um, with this, it was in Canada, and he was <laughs> released from a uh, contract, and he just kept talking about how he was eating a cookie, and he didn't know what to say. So with that, he obviously had poor planning skills, um, and it made him look really bad, and his company look really bad. So this is just an example of how he tried to wing it, and it was a poor reflection on him. So that's the Stephen Duckett video, and I will send that out as well. So here's uh, kind of how you want to plan your presentation. First, you want to determine your purpose. So what is your purpose of the presentation? What are you trying to do? What's the purpose? Uh, second, you want to analyze the audience. So who are you talking to? Who's your audience members? You want to analyze that. And three, you want to select a delivery method. So how are you going to deliver the message? So right now, I'm delivering a message via technology. But uh, with any of our projects or speeches, you'll be doing it in class. So I'll walk through that again. First, you want to determine your purpose. Second, you want to analyze your audience. And third, you want to select your delivery method. So there's different kinds of purposes you can have. You can report. So that's if you're just giving information. So you're just reporting information. So say you were on a project and you got called into a meeting and you were just reporting on... Uh, what your progress was. So you're just giving facts and information, reporting. To explain, so this would be more of a step-by-step -step approach. So uh, if you were going to do how to play guitar, <laughs> this is just an example, you're actually explaining it. Or if you were going to explain how to deliver a speech effectively, that would be actually explaining. So you're walking through a step-by-step -step process. You can persuade so when you're persuading, um, you can either persuade your audience to agree with you or change their opinion if they don't agree with you. So persuasion is also something you can do. Or you can motivate. So motivating would be, some examples would be social movements. So say you want to motivate people to become one with a cause or to join your um, cause or something you're passionate about, you can motivate the audience. So if you want to refer to more examples of that, you can go to page 369 um, in your text, and that's figure one. So different kinds of purposes for speech is to report, 
to explain, to persuade, and to motivate. If you want to see those with examples, go to page 369, and it's figure one. So next, in audience analysis, it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, you're going to look at demographic features of your audience. So you're going to look at age, um, maybe sexual orientation, class, race, different demographics on how you're going to appeal to your audience. So in audience analysis, you're going to look at demographic factors first. Then you're going to look at level of knowledge about your topic. So say you picked a specific topic and your audience was really, really educated about it, then you know that you could talk at a higher level of intelligence with that audience. If you know maybe they don't know that much about it, you might have to bring your information down a bit to communicate more effectively. So look at the demographic factors, look at the level of knowledge um, your audience holds about your topic, and also your audience's psychological needs. So psychological needs would be things like their values that they hold, their attitudes, and their beliefs. So when looking at an audience analysis, look at demographic factors, um, level of knowledge about the topic you're speaking on, and then also the psychological needs of your audience. So that would be things like values, attitudes, and beliefs. So these factors will give you clues to how you want to deliver your message um, so it'll give you clues about how you want to deliver your overall content, how, what tone do you want to speak in, what types of examples you should use, uh, what types of questions to expect in return from your audience, and even the way you should dress. So you really need to think about your audience when you're thinking about how you are constructing your speech. So an audience analysis will help you determine everything about your speech, including content, the tone you speak in, types of examples that you use, how you dress, and types of questions to expect in return. Typically, larger audiences require a more formal presentation, so that'll be more formal, more structured, because it's larger. So if you're talking to a larger audience, you need to be able to keep it on track and to be organized. If you have a smaller audience, it can be a little more informal and more of a conversation. So that's something to keep in mind, the size of your audience. You also want to consider the effect of your message on your audience and also your credibility with them. So does your audience view you as credible, knowing about the topic, or do they not think you're credible? Because if they don't, then they're not going to believe anything you're saying. And if your audience is unfamiliar with your topic, so if they don't know about it, you should be clear and use easy to understand language with lots of visuals and examples. So if you know you're picking this topic that your audience doesn't know much about, you want to use clear, simplistic language, and you want to use a lot of visuals. So that covered um, your audience analysis, okay? So you want to think about your audience analysis uh, when you're planning your presentation. So, moving on. Psychological needs. So this is what we talked about before. Psychological needs are values, attitudes, and beliefs. So if you think your audience will be hostile toward you personally or your message, so if you think they're going to be angry with you or your message, um, you need to oversell yourself to your proposal. So if you think they'll be hostile, you need to oversell yourself, build that credibility, and um, that relationship with your audience. So in addition to establishing your credibility, you may need to use other experts to quote. So in addition to establishing you as a credible speaker, you may need to quote other experts to build your case. So this would be evidence. You can use other experts that speak on that topic to build the case that you're arguing for. Um, same same content um, presented to a different audience has to be tailored to each. So when you're delivering a speech publicly, you got to think about your audience. Audience is really, really important. And in speech, public speaking, we use this term called audience-centeredness. Audience-centeredness. So audience-centeredness is basically what you hear. Your speech is focused around your audience. So say you were delivering a speech on, okay, I did some research on The Bachelorette, and I presented it at two different conferences, and one of them was just based on media, and another one was a women's studies conference. So I tweaked 
what the content was about based on my audience and who I was talking to. So you always want to think about your audience and how you're presenting the information, even if it's the same topic. Audience, you're going to have to tweak it. Kind of like what we discussed, if you go out over the weekend, you might share different stories with your friends than you would tell to your grandmother. It's just different. So if, based on your audience, you're going to change your message. Uh, lastly, your delivery method. So we just talked about determining your purpose, analyzing your audience, and now we're going to talk about the last step, so delivery method. So there's three main steps when you're planning your presentation. You want to determine the purpose of it. Why are you doing this? Do an audience analysis, which we talked about. And lastly, selecting a delivery method. So selecting a delivery method. I want you all to open up the Steve Jobs graduation speech and take a look at that for this example. Um, so there's two different ways you can deliver a speech. So there's an, it's called impromptu and extemporaneous. So impromptu and extemporaneous. Impromptu is when you're on the spot, right? So you're in, on the spot, informal, someone might just ask you a question. And another example of this would be the Stephen Duckett video that you just watched. He was, that was impromptu, and he was not ready for it. So it broke his credibility as a speaker. Not good. So impromptu is on the spot when someone just asks you a question and you're able to respond. That's what impromptu is. That's a delivery method. Then there's a thing called extemporaneous. So extemporaneous speaking is an enhanced conversational style. It's organized and fluid, and it's presented from an outline. So you're going to outline it, but it's more fluid, more of a conversation, not rehearsed. It's like you're actually having a conversation with structure. So when you hear the word extemporaneous, think of structured, but conversation, not rehearsed. So it's more fluid. Uh, people feel more connected to you. Um, this would be, an example of this would be some business environments have become less formal, right, and less rigid. So an extemporaneous speaking style would really fit well there. And when you're extemporaneously speaking, you are having more of a dialogue and you want your audience to feel connected to you. So an example of a good speaker who uses extemporaneous delivery is Steve Jobs. So if you watch that Steve Jobs video, his graduation speech, you'll see a good example of extemporaneous speaking. So that first uh, delivery method is both impromptu and extemporaneous, which kind of go hand in hand. They're more of a conversation, more fluid. Uh, but no, impromptu is when you're put on the spot, asked a question, you respond. Extemporaneous, you're still going to have an outline, you're still going to prep it, but it's more of a conversation. Secondly, you can deliver a speech through scripted and memorized delivery method. So this is, um, this is when you're reading directly from notes. So this would be if I read directly from my notes, but it wasn't as much of a conversation with you all. So if I just had my lecture notes just in front of my face the entire time, reading directly off of them, which isn't very engaging, um, and it's not really a good way to engage with your audience. So some examples of this could be if you did a ceremonial speech. So say you were delivering a wedding toast, you might read off of it. That's an example they used in your book, but I think that should be more extemporaneous as well. Remember, memorizing takes time. It's also risky, and it makes the speaker seem more mechanical. So think about it. Are you going to feel more connected to somebody who is engaging in more of a dialogue with you? Or are you going to be uh, more engaged with somebody who's just reading off of a script? So there's different um, contextual situations for these, but typically extemporaneous speaking works the best because it's fluid and you're feeling like you're having more of a conversation to engage your audience. So moving on. We're going to talk about organizing your presentation. So how to actually organize um, this presentation. So this is the breakdown when organizing. You're going to want to have 15% of your speech, your intro, 75% your body, and 10% your conclusion. So 15% is your intro, 75 is your body, and 10% is your conclusion. Don't begin with, hi, my name is so-and-so, 
and I'm going to talk about this. Hi, my name's Kristen, and I'm going to talk about how to make brownies today. No, no, no. That doesn't attract anybody's attention. You don't want to do that. And never just say thank you and smile. Never end like that. So you know you don't want to say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm going to talk about this. And you never want to end with thanks. Bye. Not good when you're delivering a speech. So this is how it's broken down. Also, I sent you guys two outline templates. So if you take a look at those, I sent an announcement about it. Um, and that will give you an exact outline template of what you need to do in this course. And also, if you want to use it for other classes, how you can outline papers and speeches. Um, so the intro and introduction will always have four parts, okay? So you have an attention getter for your first part, speaker's credibility. So why should we listen to you talk about this? Why are you credible? Three, relevance to audience. So how is this relevant to your audience? Why should we care about it? And for your thesis, and typically, you'll have three main points. So say you wanted to talk about how running is good for you. You could say running is really good for you because of its cardio benefits, muscular benefits, and mental benefits. So that way we know you're talking about running, health benefits, and what three health benefits you're talking about. So I'll say that again. The intro always has an attention getter as first, credibility as a speaker, why should we listen to you, three, relevance to audience, and four, your thesis with your three main points. Um, also, there, the example of this is on page 375 in your text, and it's figure four. So 375 in your text, figure four. Introduction is an attention getter, credibility, relevance to audience, and a thesis with three main points. Moving on to your body. The body always has the three main points, subpoints, and transitions. So three main points would be the three main things we're talking about. Subpoints is your evidence. So that's how you're developing your points. So the body conveys real content. It develops the points you introduced. It gives background information, specific evidence, implication, Support evidence with stats, experiences, examples, and, ex and support from experts. So in your body, this is where you're really expanding on your three main points, and this is where you're building your case. So when you're presenting a speech, this is where you're really going in depth um, with your thesis. So this is where you're expanding. So know your body always has your three main points, subpoints that support those main points, and then transitions. Your conclusion always has the restatement of the three main points, so you're going to restate them in the same order that they were in. So say you're doing, today I'm going to talk about the health benefits of running, which include cardio, muscular, and psychological or mental. Then at the end of your speech, to conclude, you'd say, in conclusion, the three main running benefits, or three main health benefits of running is cardio, muscular, and mental. So in your thesis, which is always the last part of your introduction, you have those three main points. And then in your conclusion, you're restating them in the same order. So you're getting those three main points twice. Also, you need a wow statement. So your wow statement is kind of like your attention getter. And like I said, on page 375, figure four, there's examples of this. Um, with that, you can use a quote. You can use a rhetorical question. You could use a story, for example. If you wanted to use a video clip, these are just some examples of what you could do for an attention getter or a wow statement. You want to finish on a strong, upbeat note, leaving your audience with a clear and simple message. So, introduction, attention getter, credibility, relevance to audience, thesis statement with three main points, body, three main points, subpoints, transitions. Conclusion, restatement of three main points in the same order as your thesis, and a wow statement. So that's how you outline, and there are outlines available on Blackboard for your reference. Also remember the breakdown, 15% to your intro, 75% to your body, 10 to your conclusion. Also, one last thing, don't ever apologize during your speech. A lot of people will get off track and apologize and say they're sorry and get really flustered, don't do that. So just keep going um, when you're delivering your speech. Okay, moving on. Crafting an effective body. 
You want to provide support in an easy to understand form, provide relevant statistics, use quotes from prominent people, use interesting anecdotes, and use uh, presentation visuals. This is what you're going to do when you are crafting your body. So the body of your presentation contains your support. And if you're creating a PowerPoint, the main points are usually the title of your slide, and then the subpoints are short bullets. So if you want to present your information visually, remember that main points are usually the title of the slide in PowerPoint, and the subpoints are usually the short bullets. And you always want less is more with text in PowerPoint. So you always just want to have bullets, and you want to be able to talk when you're presenting. So don't write everything on the actual PowerPoint. You don't want to use jargon or unethical jokes, so jargon can get people confused. Avoid that. Also, if you use paraphrasing, you have to cite your sources by using the name and year during your presentation. So say you use a bunch of sources, you would have to say things like, you wouldn't say, I got this from a New York Times article. You should say something like, uh, Bill Jones quoted in the New York Times article last month that. Or you could say something like, Nancy Pope in her article found in the Journal of Media Studies said this. So we need to hear who wrote the quote and where it came from. So that's how you would do an oral citation when you are actually delivering a speech. So you always want to include the source title and the author's name. So if I said something and you wanted to use it, you could say that I wrote a quote in City Beat. You could say, according to Kristen Stein in the January edition of City Beat, and then write the quote. So you need that oral citation in your body. So the body, you want to choose a logical sequence, okay? So we're moving on to the next slide. Choose a logical sequence. You need a clear organization of main points and subpoints in order to figure out how things fit together. So listeners need a clear organization of main points and subpoints in order to figure out how things fit together. So different, some different organizational things you could use are chronological, so that's time order. So this tells what occurred, first, second, third, etc., or steps in a process. So no chronological is time order, tells what occurred first, second, or third. This would be like an historical event or a timeline, or steps in a process. So like if you were doing how to bake a cake, you would say first you do this, second you do this, third you do this. You can do a topical organization. So this is natural divisions or categories in any possible area. So you choose two to five things that are most important and focus on that. So it's topical. It's categorized by important topics. Then you can do cause and effect. So you can begin cause and effect. Um, you can begin cause and go to effect. So cause, um, so you would have, this is what caused this and then this is what the effect is out of that. So you can use cause and effect organization as well. So you need to have an overall organization of main points, and then you need to use a similar structure for subpoints uh, for them to understand. So you just need to make sure you're actually having a structure to your speech body, having a clear organization. All right, delivering as a team. So if you have to deliver as a team, you want to select a winning team, agree on a purpose and a schedule, plan seamless transitions and build a natural bridge between sections, and deliver and field questions as a team. So you want this to be cohesive if you're delivering as a team. So you want to achieve coherence by making your team presentation look as though it were pre prepared and given by a single person. So you want to achieve coherence by making your team presentation look as though it were prepared and given by a single person. So everyone in your team speaks and answers questions, not just one person. You want to rehearse the PowerPoint as it will be given, including transitions for people and topics. So you want to actually rehearse the PowerPoint with your team. You want to also answer questions during your presentation as a team. So before the presentation, think of some possible questions and answers. Make sure all teammates field questions.
So you want to achieve coherence, right? So group members should decide beforehand on the presentation tone, format, organization, and visuals. So group members should decide beforehand on the presentation tone, format, organization, and visuals. You also should agree on what to wear, how are you going to present yourself, how to handle questions, and how to transition from one speaker to the other. So achieving coherence, you need to decide beforehand on the presentation tone, format, organization, and visuals. You also need to agree on what you want to wear, how do you want to present your group, and how you should handle questions, and how you want to transition from one speaker to the other. Also, if you have a visual, you want to have one editor review all slides for consideration. So I'll walk through that again. Group members should decide beforehand presentation tone, format, organization, and visuals. You also need to agree on what you want to wear, how to handle questions, and how to transition from one speaker to the other. Also, you need to have one editor review the entire PowerPoint or whatever visuals you use for, co uh, for coherence and consistency. When you are practicing, you need to have a full-scale rehearsal with visuals in the room where you're going to present. So if you were doing a group presentation at work, you actually want to prep the presentation and practice it in the actual room you would present it in with your group. So you actually want to practice with them and you want to coordinate introductions, transitions, and positioning. So if you go to the bad group presentation video that I sent uh, through email, it's, a, it's called bad group presentation. Uh, if you click that, it's in YouTube, and you can watch that, and it's an example of what you don't want to look like. So take a look at that. So now you want to achieve co coherence, and you also want to practice with your group. Moving on, presentation design principles. So if you actually have to design um, a visual. So you want to limit the number of visuals that you use. Use limited text and powerful images to develop one idea per slide. So one idea per slide, limit the amount of text, but use powerful images to develop that idea. You want to use an effective template, fonts, and color scheme for appeal and easy reading. So you want it to actually look nice and it needs to be easy for your audience to read. Capitalize the first letter of bullets. Eliminate periods if you're using PowerPoint and avoid abbreviations. You want to reflect legal and ethical responsibility, and you want to proofread carefully. All of that is on your slide. So with PowerPoint, you want to follow the 7-7 rule, so there's no more than seven words across or seven lines down. So in PowerPoint, it's called the 7-7 rule. No more than seven words across or seven lines down. Don't use full sentences. Uh, just use main words or main thoughts no periods. It can be difficult to engage your audience if you're standing behind the computer. So you want to actually have like a clicker or you want to be able to move around while you're talking. You also don't want to use too many colors. So you don't want to use more than three colors and you want to avoid the use of red and green next to each other because approximately 13% of the population is colorblind and cannot see the difference between these two colors. So don't use too many colors no more than three. Avoid the use of red and green next to each other because 13% of the population is colorblind and can't tell the difference between these two colors. And also then it would just look like Christmas probably and you probably don't want that. Also, don't use more than three fonts. So don't use more than three colors. Don't use more than three fonts. And you want to use simple fonts. Also, you need to use spell check. So make sure you spell check the presentation. And you always want to make a citation page if you're using sources and include that in your presentation. So you want to present your main points clearly. So main points are up front and reinforced through your slides. So always remember, main points are up front and reinforced through your slides. You want to make your presentation easy to follow. So clear organization keeps your audience and you focused. So you want to be focused and organized so your audience can follow you, so make sure your presentation is easy to follow. So have a clear organization to keep the flow and keep your audience on track. Choose an appropriate and attractive design. So like we talked about, no more than three colors, no more than three fonts. Don't have all those crazy spending things going around. 
You want it to look nice, simple, clear, concise. So choose attractive and appropriate design. And you want to try to replace your text with graphics. So use graphics and a few select words. So the presentation relies more on your delivery skills um, and less on actual words that are on the PowerPoint. So you want to use graphics and a few select words so the presentation relies less on the visual and more on the delivery. So text-heavy slides may tempt you to uh, read them the entire time. Obviously, you're going to glance at them. That's normal. But if you have text-heavy slides, it'll tempt you to read them more. So try to cut down how many uh, words you have on your slides. And graphics will also make the slides more visually appealing, and it will show how concepts relate to one another. So try to replace text with graphics when you can, and you want to write simply and clearly. So an example of this is figure 16, page 388 in your text. So write simply and clearly. You want to be simple and clear on your PowerPoint. A good example of this is example um, figure 16 on page 388. So refer to that in your textbook. So here's an example of um, a reduced text on the next slide. So you can take a look at that. And let's see. Lastly, well, we just talked about this, the 7-7 seven, seven rule. So no more than seven words, are, seven words are crossed, seven words down. So you want to use visuals to support your presentation, not detract from you as a speaker. So use your visual to enhance your presentation, not take away from you. So if you have a slide up, make sure you're not just talking to it the entire time. Use that to help you talk to your audience. Make sure the audience can see your slides easily. Always avoid walking in front of the slides. So if they're behind you, don't stand in front of them because then people won't be able to see them. So make sure that they can see them easily. Don't stand in front of them. Avoid having your back to the audience. So that would be like if I was delivering this to you like this. That's not good. So don't do that. Don't try not to have your back to the audience during your presentation. Uh, avoid that. You want to be making that human connection and building that relationship with your audience. If you want to draw attention to the actual slide, you can refer to them with your arm, so you can point. Or if you have a laser, you could point at it. So if you want to draw attention to something, you can do that by using your arm or a laser. And consider when you display your slides, video. So we use videos in this class, and video can engage your audience, illustrate a point, and um, can make an emotional appeal. So videos can engage your audience, illustrate a point, and make an emotional appeal. Videos should have a clear purpose though, so don't just throw a bunch of videos in there <laughs> just because you like them. So make sure the videos um, go hand in hand with what you're actually talking about and they have a purpose. And also if you're using a video in a presentation, make sure the video works on the computer you're presenting on and that the volume's on. So you can use video. Here's a good thing, handout. So if you're handing something out, to your audience uh, when you're going to deliver a presentation. You want to supplement your presentation, provide space for note taking, um, or if you want to give a permanent record of your presentation, this is when you would use handouts. So if you want to supplement your presentation, provide space for note taking, um, or have a permanent record of the presentation, this is when you would use handouts. So you could call a handout a takeaway, right? So they take it with them. and. Um, it can help your audience follow what you're talking about. So this is when you would use handouts. So supplement your presentation, provide space for note taking, so they have a permanent record of your presentation having a takeaway, and it will help your audience follow what you're talking about. Um, so say, here's how you can break it down. If you know you're gonna be talking about something like really, really com complex at work, uh, you can send handouts ahead of time. So send them via email if you're, say, having a meeting, a group meeting at work, and then everybody can have them ahead of time and take a look over them. So complex information, send a handout ahead of time. If you can refer during the presentation, so say you're just going to give it to them and you are going to refer to it during the presentation, you can hand that out immediately before, before the presentation. So if it's not really complex, but you're just giving them a handout to refer to, you can give that to them right before the presentation. But disadvantage of this, 
if someone gives out notes or a handout, the audience may just be looking at the notes the entire time. So if I handed out notes, you guys might just be like this, reading and not actually paying attention to what I was saying. So the disadvantage is that the audience may refer to the notes rather than you as the speaker. So you can choose to wait after the presentation. That's why in class, I do the lecture and then I send the notes after. Um, I just think it's more effective to have the audience be more engaged. So you can kind of judge what you think, but that's just how kind of how some public speaking researchers explain it. So if it's a complex thing you're going to be talking about, you can send a handout ahead of time. If it's going to be something you want to reference during your speech, you can hand give a handout right beforehand. Uh, but disadvantage to that is that your audience might be like this the entire time looking at the handout instead of listening to you. So think about that. When you are practicing, so when you're practicing your speech, you want to use shorter sentences and simpler vocabulary for oral presentations. So practicing, you want to use shorter sentences and simpler vocab for oral presentations than for written presentations. So your written presentations would have longer sentences and maybe more in-depth vocab, but oral presentations, shorter sentences and simpler vocabulary. When you practice, it will build your confidence and help you engage your audience. So make sure you practice so you can build your confidence as a speaker and engage your audience rather than putting them to sleep, which you guys might be doing right now. But think about how you can engage your audience. Um, and with that, you should by practicing. So don't just wing it. Actually practice it so you feel confident in what you're saying. You want to plan a minimum of three run-throughs. So practice at least three times before you deliver your speech. And you want to use natural um, hand and arm gestures to add an emphasis on points in the presentation. So you're not going to be like going crazy the entire time, but do what feels normal. So I always say pay attention to how you are interacting with your friends and kind of apply that to the public speaking setting. So if you're having a conversation, you're using some gestures, some you know nonverbal body language, bring that into when you are publicly speaking. So natural hand and arm movements are great. It engages your audience and emphasizes points. You want to speak in a conversational tone. So that would be back to that extemporaneous word we were talking about. So you want to be having more of a conversation, but you want it to be enhanced and slightly slower. So having a conversation with your audience, but still slowing it down and having it controlled is what you want to aim for when public speaking. No jingling your keys, no coughing or clearing your throat, swaying or pacing or playing with your hair or jewelry. Uh, so hands in pockets, avoid that. I had a student that had bangs and she would always go like this. Don't do that. If you know you do that, put your hair up. Don't do that when you're presenting. So no jingling keys. Try not to cough or clear your throat the entire time. Don't sway. Don't pace back and forth the entire time. Try not to play with your hair or jewelry. Avoid vocal fillers. So vocal fillers are things like ums, likes, you knows. We all have some. Sometimes try to think about if you are going to say um, just pause instead. So try not to um, just pause. So now I want you to open the bad, let's see, there's a ton of them. Not the bad group presentation, but bad speech example, bad speech example, bad speech example, George Bush, and bad speech example. I want you to take a look at each of these and actually watch them and critique them. So think about what are they doing verbally that's not correct, and also what are they doing non-verbally that's not good, that's distracting as a speaker. Also think about their organization. Is the organization of this following the outline? Does it have an intro, a body, and a conclusion? Does it have an attention getter, credibility, relevance to audience, thesis, three main points, sub points? Does it have transitions? Does it have your restatement of your three main points and a wow statement? So look at the structure, look at the delivery, both verbal and nonverbal, and critique these. So think about what could they be doing better, more effectively as a speaker. So watch each of those. Also, when you're delivering your speech, you want to dress comfortably. So you want to dress um, a little bit dressier than your audience. So slightly dressier than your audience. Clothing is a part of your message, so you communicate to the audience. So clothing is a part of the message you're communicating to your audience. 
and you need to try to make eye contact with everybody in the classroom for at least three seconds each. So I know they say, stare at the back wall. Don't do that. You want to actually try to make eye contact with everybody in the audience. Overcoming speech anxiety. So I know a lot of people get nervous, and that's completely normal to do that when you're going to deliver a speech. I want you to watch uh, the King's speech, final speech, overcoming speech anxiety clip. And this is really inspirational. If, you have, if you've seen this film or if you haven't, um, the film is showing how... Um, so King George had a speech impediment, and then he had really bad speech anxiety. And since he was the king, he had to orally deliver messages all the time. So this entire film is about um, his coach, who was coaching him through, working through his speech impediment, and then also working through his speech anxiety. And this is at the end of the film when he delivers his big speech, and it's really touching and moving. And so if he can do it, he had a speech impediment, any one of you can do it. It's just overcoming that speech anxiety, and we all feel it, so don't feel like you're crazy, because everybody has it. It's just overcoming it. So you want to use your natural stress to your advantage. Everybody's going to feel anxiety and stress when they need to get in front of people to talk, but use that to your advantage. You want to prepare, concentrate on the friendly faces, and you want to practice mental imagery. So imagine yourself giving the speech, and it's going well. So, concentrate on friendly faces. You actually want to prepare the speech. It'll build your confidence. And you want to practice mental imagery. So, imagine you giving the speech and then it going well. You can do breathing also. So, a lot of people, I tell them, take three deep breaths in through their nose, out through their mouth. Three times before you go up. You can also do um, tension exercises. So, say you're really nervous. You can start in your hands. Hold them like this for 10 seconds, really tight. Slowly release them, one by one. And when you do tension exercises, that will relax you as well. So I tell students, before you go to deliver a speech, do the tension exercises if you're nervous. Take three deep breaths. <sighs> Mental imagery, so actually imagining yourself delivering that speech and kicking ass, and it'll work for you. So that's some tips for you if you have some speech anxiety. Also, lastly, I want you to look at the last um, YouTube video, Overcoming Speech Anxiety. It's under the King Speech one. And this will give you some more examples of how you can overcome speech anxiety. So make sure you are referencing those outline templates and going over that outlining section in your book. So you know what you can use for attention getters, for credibility, for relevance, for a thesis, main points, and elaborating on main points, and also your conclusion. I'm also going to post all of these notes on Blackboard. So make sure you're watching these videos, and if you have any questions about